great, thank you. Um, so tonight I am happy to introduce um, our, our speaker for tonight's Science Pub, Elizabeth Crisfield, um, to talk about stewardship of xeric habitats of, for rare bees and moths in the Northeastern US. Um, Elizabeth is an independent consultant supporting state agencies on a variety of projects related to biodiversity conservation. Elizabeth has degrees in physics, agronomy, and geography, and considers herself a translational ecologist. Uh, she managed a multi-site project in the Northeast um, over the last five years, and will present the results of that project this evening. Um, it's a project I'm very excited about because we participated in this project for the past five years, as uh, did the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more from Elizabeth. So with that, thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And then there we go. So you should be able to see my title slide now. All right. Um, yeah, so thanks everybody for joining tonight. Um, I am happy to present the results of this five-year project. It was developed by the Northeast Fish and Wildlife Diversity Tech Committee. And I'll talk more about that in a second, um, but it was a large complex project. Um, and many people beyond the ones listed on this title slide were involved in the project for the last five years, um, actually ending in February, 2023. So five years before that. Um, and since, um, since I'm just not sure of everybody's background and, and um, knowledge, I'm gonna put a lot of background in my slides. Hopefully I'm not saying stuff you already know. Um, but this project was a multi-state collaboration. Um, the state wildlife agencies are members of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, which focuses on the US, but also involves Canadian provinces. Um, the association is divided into regions and this project was focused on the Northeast region which covers Virginia and West Virginia North, um, in this case to Maine for this project. Um, so the representatives of each from each state that are responsible for preserving biodiversity in the states, they work together on the Northeast Wildlife Diversity Tech Technical Committee. Um, and you can learn more about their work on northeastwildlifediversity.org and I'll put that on my last slide. Um, so these are the people that were responsible for initiating this project and funding it with their pooled state wildlife grant funds through their program, which is called the Regional Conservation Needs Grant Program. Mm -hmm. um, so for this talk, I'm going to follow a little bit of a scientific presentation, but um, I'm going to start with the motivation and the objectives, but I'm going to touch on key findings throughout the presentation. Hey, Elizabeth, can yeah. I pause you a sec? You are on one side that is a looks like a um, log that's burning. OK, I just wanted to make sure that you weren't my pretty background for my like funding source acknowledgement. OK, great, because you were saying these people on the slide and I don't see any. So oh, I to... that was on this slide. OK, great. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I know that's to fine. Thank you went you. Too far. I'm like, right. oh, is this not working? <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Um, I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. So, and then, um, so then we'll go over some results and I'll, I'll mix some takeaways in with the results and then um, make sure that I leave you with uh, what we learned from the project about um, managing these sites. Okay, so our overall project objective was to improve habitat management at these sites. Um, we started with a survey to make sure we understood challenges we learned from the site managers that were involved in the project. Um, and one aspect was that prescribed fire can be really hard to actually implement. There are conflicts with adjacent land uses. Um, most sites cited a limited capacity to um, have a burn crew, to get a burn crew from the state. There was just a limited capacity of trained teams. Um, most sites have a very narrow window when those environmental conditions permit fire and they may have constraints from endangered species on the site. Um, and federal funding usually can't be used to support prescribed fire. So there's also a funding source limitation. And so because prescribed fire can be so hard to use, even though it, it can be one of one really nice way to help manage these sites, we wanted to look into some alternatives like mowing, disking, thinning, herbicide. Um, and then we wanted to look at how 
the ecosystem responded, primarily through vegetation responses, which we expected to see within the time frame of the project, but also um, the impacts on bees and moths, which of which there are a number of rare species associated with these habitats. Um, so why, why did we focus on xeric habitats? Um, in the Northeast, these, these fire adapted grasslands and barrens support uh, a large number of rare species. And it's, it's more than just pollinators. Eastern box turtle is one that's associated with the habitat, but lots of young forest species can be found at these sites. Um, and so in addition to improving the habitat condition in support of all of these rare species, we also wanted to help address this data gap um, in the poorly surveyed species of bees and moths. Um, okay, so what is a xeric habitat? Um, so technically they are defined by their physical characteristics. Um, they are dry, they are well-drained, nutrient poor soils. And this definition is derived from a lot of um, like iconic sites and also a lot of work in the Midwest where this they have a similar kind of habitat type. Um, but functionally in the Northeast, these sites are barrens. Um, they have less canopy cover than other habitat types or just thinner vegetation density. <clears throat> NatureServe defines barrens as, and this is long, areas of persisting sparse, low, open or otherwise distinctive vegetation, typically on thin patchy soils or rocky substrates, often with unusual rock or soil chemistry or in special topographic settings. Um, so there's a range of physical conditions that lead to this comparatively barren vegetation con condition. Um, and sites in this study um, had, had a range of terms that were used for them. They were not all called barrens. There are sand plains, heathlands, scrub oak shrublands, pitch pine oak woodlands, um, and lots of other combinations and, and use distinct words. Um, so the reason that I'm, I'm focusing on this for, for a moment here is that to prescribe best practices, we have to put bounds on the habitat we intend them to be used in. So defining the habitat type for this project was a really important foundation for this presentation and for the results and communicating where you can use these results. Um, and so, so where are the xeric habitats? So this slide is showing you the sites are all with black dots showing you where um, we were, the sites that participated in our project. Um, and you can see they're really spread out across different ecoregions, um, across climatic zones, um, you know, we have coastal sites, which do have some similarities with each other. They, they are sandier sites, um, but some of the inland floodplain sites are pretty sandy. Um, and then in the Appalachians, we have some sandy sites, but we also have more shaly sites. Presque Isle is, you know, it's a beach, it's a beach site. So, um, so I think it's really important for the context of my presentation and what you can take away from this project to see how large an area we were studying. Um, it's different than if you were to focus on um, like the Atlantic islands or, or some more restricted geographic scope. Um, and so the, the reality is that the, there was a diversity of site conditions um, involved in this project and it, it did make it difficult to define the management guidelines precisely. Um, but nonetheless, we learned a ton and I'm, I'm just going to roll right into what we learned. Um, uh, and I guess before, okay, before, before what we learned, I'm going to talk a little bit about bees and moths. And I don't want to presume that people know some of these key life history traits. So I'm going to go through some background. Hopefully it's not too much review. Um, but, you know, our question was, um, why are bees and moths in this habitat rare and of interest and um, which ones and which conditions support the most diversity? These are the kinds of questions we were seeking answers to. Um, 
And so this is the life cycle of a bee. And um, I want to clarify, we're not talking about honeybees here. Those are not native to North America. So we are talking about the native bees. And of them, not so much talking about bumblebees, more of the solitary bees. Um, so, you know, adults visit flowers to collect pollen um, and queens lay eggs in nests that they provision with pollen for the larvae to eat. Um, and the larvae typically pupate in that nest before emerging. Um, so bumblebees and honeybees have social order, but most of most other bees are solitary. They may live in the same area with other bees, but they're not working together. And 70 to 80% of bees nest underground in tunnels and chambers, you know, sometimes in burrows left by other animals. And then the rest of them nest in wood or stems. They're called cavity nesters. About 20% of bees are kleptoparasitic. So they don't make their own nests and provision them. They go into another bee's nest and lay their egg. And then their larvae eat the pollen that the other bee provisioned. Um, and those bees are typically more rare than their hosts. And sometimes we can think of them as indicators of habitat um, quality or, or stable populations. Um, and in most cases, a mated female will overwinter underground and the males usually don't overwinter. Um, some species are specialists with respect to pollen, plants and pollen. Um, and others may be a little bit more indiscriminate. And we don't, we don't really have plant associations for all the species. Um, it's kind of an expanding frontier, but we do know some of these plants, um, plant associations. Um, and then I'm gonna go through the same thing for moths. Um, oh, sorry. Um, just to dr dr drive home that point about um, species um, being, bee species being soil nesters. Um, this species is an indicator of species in grassland sites in our project. Um, and it's just just to show you what it looks like, what what a what a um, entrance to a bee nest might look like. Um, and to be honest, um, the soil nesting requirements of bees is really not very well known. But one of the reasons that we hypothesize rare bees would be um, found in our sites is that, you know, the sites are defined by their soils. They have dry soils, they have sandy soils. Um, and so some bees may only be able to nest in the kinds of soils you would find in barren habitats. Um, so that's one reason we think we may have some habitat specialists in these sites. Okay. Um, and so let's look at the same thing for moths. Um, so, you know, thanks to the hungry caterpillar by Eric Carle and like a lot of media attention for monarchs, we're pretty familiar with this life cycle. And we know that um, caterpillars go through metamorphosis in a um, pupae and then uh, emerge as adults. Um, but one thing that I think is easy to have a misconception about is that most butterflies and moths really don't migrate. A few specialized butterflies and moths do, but um, most, of, most of the species are really on site all the time. Um, so the entire life cycle occurs on the site. And this um, is true of bees as well, and is one of the things we were really trying to keep in mind when we thought about management activities. Um, so larvae generally eat leaves and uh, many of them have certain host plants or a family of plants. Um, as adults, they can fly for reproduction and feeding, um, though some adult moths don't seem to eat at all. Eggs are usually laid on their host plants. Um, most Lepidoptera overwinter as pupae but some overwinter as larva or even eggs, um, and they may be on woody plants, but I think more of them are in the leaf litter or in the soil. Um, so again, we, you know, we were thinking about all these things so that we could think about habitat management and pollinator conservation um, and thinking about the vulnerabilities of these species to the actions that we might take. Um, so if we have to scrape or plow the soil, we need to know when the species are underground. Um, if we need to burn, we need to make sure they've emerged from the leaf litter. Um, 
And as and also recognizing as adults, they're mobile and they may be able to escape damage from habitat management. Whereas in their immobile states, they're just whatever we do is going to happen to them and they can't get away. Um, so these are all factors we were thinking about. Um, just two slides about how we monitored them. Um, for bees, we used um, bowls of soapy water. Uh, they were laid in transects and they the bees were attracted to these bright colored bowls. Um, and then the specimens were sent to experts for identification. Um, these are quite hard to identify and um, photographs usually can't get them down to more than genus. Um, and most, most sites surveyed for at least three years during the project and in five sampling windows from May through September. And for moths, we use these UV bucket traps. Um, this was one, we, we actually started the moth sampling later than the bees because we weren't quite sure how to do it in the beginning. Um, but we contracted a small group to go to each site run the traps and do the identifications and um, vouchering the, the samples. Um, and those surveys were done in 2021 and 2022 in approximately the same time frame. although we did go a little earlier and a little later to get the full diversity. Um, and both protocols took into consideration the presence of endangered species, so we didn't trap at sites or times when frosted elfin would be flying, for example, we didn't want to accidentally take any frosted elfin. Okay, um, so over the course of the project, we were able to document 276 species of bees, and there are probably more than 700 species in our region. So <clears throat> we, we saw many of them, um, and 171 of those had less than 10, 10 observations. So they might be only found at one site or they might've been found just a couple of them at a couple of sites. Um, we did a lot of research to try to determine from the literature which species were xeric obligates or xeric associated. Um, and we found 15 of them, but we didn't find them all. So um, the ones that we didn't find are, you know, are probably more of a concern because we, we should have found them. Um, and then we found three regional species of greatest conservation need and six regional assessment priorities. Um, RSGC on regional species of greatest conservation need is a non-regulatory conservation concern status that indicates that the Northeast region, that, that group that I talked about, they've reviewed all the species. They have determined that these species are um, in decline or imperiled in the Northeast region, and they want to work together on those species. So these are the three species that we found um, that were regional species of greatest conservation need. Um, same sum summary for moths. We found over 1,500 unique species, and we believe there are more than 3,000 in our region. So we found half of them. Um, I mean, some of them are really common. You would probably find them just about anywhere you looked. So they're not they're not xeric associated, and they're not really a, a sign of anything. Um, but 826 of them had had less than 11 observations in our data set. So um, you know, so so there were a number of rare species that we found. Um, let's see. Uh, so we yeah, we found eight regional species of greatest conservation need and eleven assessment priority species. Um, the one that's pictured here is Drosteria occulta. It is a very high concern RSGCN, um, and in the global biodiversity information. Um, I can't remember what the F stands for, G GBIF. It's a, it's a global database of, of observations. Um, this species has very few observations. Uh, so it is, it is clearly very un, underrepresented in data sets. Um, and we found it at five sites with a total of 71 observations. So we were able to add um, quite a number of places where this species can be found and observed. 
Okay, so um, so looking at both groups, the bees and the moths, um, whoops, both species were more diverse or a greater number of species at colder sites um, and drier sites. But bees were more diverse at sites with lower um, canopy cover and moths were more diverse at sites with higher canopy cover. Um, moths were more diverse at sites with less sandy soil while bees were more diverse at sites with um, higher sandy soil. So um, it was interesting to see how some environmental conditions in, increased the number of species for both groups, but how others, the response was very, was opposite. Um, so um, these findings, uh, I'm gonna link these back to those life history traits that I mentioned earlier. Um, for example, many moths use trees as host plants. So this higher canopy cover percent is probably an indication that that resource of food availability is, is beneficial to them. Um, whereas bees um, are hypothesized to need more bare soil so that they have more nesting sites. They may be more limited by their nesting conditions and they also um, need more flowering plants as food source. So they, it makes sense that these two groups would be opposite in that way. Um, and um, I don't have graphic for this, but um, we did look at sites where um, environmental, where habitat management activities occurred um, to see if there was an impact on the populations of bees or moths, either diversity, richness, or abundance. And we didn't see any impact on bees. We didn't really sample moths over a long enough time period to be able to say for sure. But we didn't see any indication of a decline in populations. Um, in, in fact, sites that had longer term management and had higher quality habitat tended to have higher bee diversity. And I think I'll be able to show you that on the next slide. Um, yeah, okay. Computer's not advancing, there we go. Um, so here's an example of showing you the sites organized by the state that they are in and the number of species observed at the site. And so that longest bar there is for Albany pine bush. Um, that is a very large spatial extent site. So it has a, a large acreage. Um, it also has been managed for an, a long time period compared to some of these sites which are more newly established. Um, and it also had a very rigorous sampling regime, like more, um, more transects, more months, more years. <clears throat> so this, this graphic is not corrected for effort, um, which is a little bit of a problem, but um, in terms of comparing, but I wanted to show it because I think it's interesting to see um, just how many species can be found at sites. Um, okay, so we might have to come back to that one later. Uh, and then just to give you an example, I talked about how bees have some associations with floral resources, and I wanted to show some of the key plant species in Barron's habitats that um, that we we believe are part partly responsible for supporting the bee populations. So all of the heaths, asters, monardas, New Jersey tea is very important for some of our most rare bees, and then the legumes, which also cross over as host plants for butterflies and moths. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned that moths can be, um, that more, more moths are using trees as host plants. I don't know if I can even say more, but many of them do. And, and the oaks are important uh, host plants for a lot of our barrens obligate species. Um, so again, sort of making sense why an increase or sites with a higher level, percent cover of, of canopy um, might be better for moths. 
Okay, so just um, revisiting this map because I'm gonna talk about the management recommendations. Um, so it turned out that the differences between the target species groups, the bees and the moths, and the differences between the sites made it hard to make a specific recommendation about how to take care of each site. So instead, we developed a process for a process really for determining the best management practices for each site given um, the unique current conditions, the goals, the constraints. So um, we have this five-step process. Um, these steps are not too surprising. I mean, anybody involved with habitat management is gonna, is gonna follow roughly these steps, but I wanna explain why for these habitats, um, you know, what the unique um, components are. Um, so for, first, assessing the current condition is super important for these sites. Um, some xeric habitats have been degraded due to anthropogenic land use or absence of fire, but some sites, even if they haven't been actively managed, haven't really changed their vegetation composition or structure that much. Um, many sites, somewhat surprisingly, don't have a lot of invasive species issues. I mean, there, there are invasive species issues, issues at some sites, but it's not as prevalent as um, more mesic sites, I, I, I think. Um, and so the first step that we recommend is to determine what this, uh, where the site is relative to the conditions that would be the target for the site. Um, so for example, are we looking at management activities to restore the site, to really change it a lot from the way it is right now to, to get closer to the target? Or is this more of a maintenance situation? Are we just stepping into a site that still looks like a barrens, but we need to restore some of the native plants or just you know modify it a little bit to bring it to a higher quality? Um, and we can set those goals in terms of the percent cover of trees, shrubs, grasses, and forbs, um, just to be quantitative about what our objectives are. Um, and we could also look at specific native bee or, or lepidoptera habitat requirements. Um, and then we would set objectives based on that assessment of where we are and where we wanna be. Um, and I'll talk more about those in a second. Um, and then we need to select the um, that best, um, best management practices to um, move toward those objectives. Um, we recommended a rotational management strategy. Um, and what we mean there is that if you have, if you have a very small site, this can be hard to do. Um, but let's talk about a, a slightly larger site for now. Um, it's best to divide the site into units and treat only one unit at a time, maybe only one unit at, in a season or maybe or per season or, um, or I guess within a year, maybe at two different times. But the goal is to make sure that there's always a source population of these pollinators to repopulate the unit um, that got treated. So from this, from a source unit to that unit. So that rotational management strategy is a way to handle rare invertebrates. And then, you know, obviously the best practice is to monitor the results of what you did. How did the vegetation change? Did it move in the direction you were hoping? And adaptively manage your, um, your next year's um, habitat management strategy. Okay, so once the current condition is described and the desired de condition is determined, it's you know time to pick uh, management practices to achieve that. Um, so the we have a report that resulted from our project that discusses the pros and cons of different management practices. Um, but because of the differences, you know, as I said, across the sites due to environmental conditions, um, the the best approach is to talk to, to another site manager or work with other site managers you know, in your eco region, for example. Okay, so here's some examples of objectives that um, you might set for a site. 
You could want to reduce the shrub and tree canopy cover if the site is overgrown. You might um, need to address invasive species. You might need to boost the native um, forbs and flowering plants. You might um, want to enhance nesting resources for bees. And then the management practices that we discuss in our project were um, you know, forestry activities, canopy thinning. Um, a lot of sites use mowing and brush, brush hogging. Prescribed fire is used um, by a lot of sites. And we also talked a lot about or and, and worked a lot on um, the season of prescribed fire. There are some sites that, I mean, typically people do prescribed fire in the dormant season, but um, some sites are experimenting with doing prescribed fire in the um, growing season. Of course, there's herbicide, which is used a lot for invasives, might even be used on natives if you're trying to shift um, composition. Uh, disc disking and harrowing to really try to get back to that bare soil condition, and then seeding and supplemental planting. Um, I don't think I mentioned this before, but some sites that have had a lot of anthropogenic use may not have a seed bed of native plants, so you may need to restore that seed bed. Um, and I just wanted to give a couple of examples, and thank you to Sarah for sharing these pictures um, with the project. There was, um, as a part of this project, the removal of Japanese pines, and um, this, these photos show how the site changed as a result of that work. Um, wonderful results. Um, and then this is a site that is a good example of a very overgrown site. These are um, two very recently acquired sites in Rhode Island where they were definitely overgrown and they went in and did a lot of clearing. The sites have not recovered yet, um, but you can see they're moving in the direction, they, they were moving in the direction of uh, reduced canopy cover. Um, so, um, I just wanted to, I mean, this is somewhat obvious, but I just wanted to close the loop here and say that as, as a result of all of the sites and all of the data that was contributed from the sites, um, overall, the management treatments that were taken included canopy thinning, mowing, and fire, and they, they resulted in decreases in total tree, shrub, and woody vegetation and increases in successional flowering plants pollinator host plant taxa, and overall plant diversity. Um, and this conclusion was based on sites that have a long-standing habitat management program and sites that were newly managed, um, though the lag in vegetation response was a little bit problematic because in five years, you know, things just don't recover fast enough, especially with some of this management happening in like the second, third year. Um, and I also, this is a little bit of a end note add on. Um, I wanted to talk about our research into how these sites, how management of these sites might change with climate change. And we actually found um, that these sites are pretty resilient. Um, and it's nice to be able to say that sometimes, right? Uh, I used the Climate Adaptation Workbook, which is provided by the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. It's a forest service um, group. It's an excellent resource that I highly recommend, and I can add information in the chat later. Um, so the reasons why it seems to be resilient are that some of our predictions in the Northeast involve, you know, wanting to protect against extreme drought in the summer or um, some severe precipitation events that might result in flooding. Um, and because the plants and animals in these sites are already adapted to low soil moisture, um, we don't think that they would be as vulnerable to a severe drought. Um, and because the soils are well drained, it seems like a flooding event uh, wouldn't be long standing at these sites that they would the water table would drop pretty quickly. Um, we also, when we really looked at the moth diversity and the moths that were detected at the sites, we found that several species that we considered to be obligate to these sites are actually habitat generalists in the Southeast. Um, 
So it sort of indicates that the, the individuals of the species that we find in the Northeast are like the northern edge of range and the advanced. Um, so if they have to retreat out of the Southeast due to climate change, they're already established in the sites where they will most be able to live. Um, let's see. And also, um, if we have well-managed sites, then they won't accumulate fuels. Um, so they won't be at risk of a severe wildfire if we had an extreme drought. Um, so it does mean that we need to manage these sites well, because they, they probably would be at risk of severe wildfire if we don't. But if we do keep on top of that fuel load, um, it should be okay. We don't really have very much other information about climate sensitivity of rare bees and moths. So, um, okay, so that was my presentation. I am sure there are questions that I didn't cover everything. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing, Sarah, and... Sure. Um, so just a reminder to everyone, if you have questions for Elizabeth, you can um, put them in the Q&A or go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, I took the opportunity, Elizabeth, to put in the um, the adaptation workbook work, workbook that you mentioned, okay. their online resource part of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's in the chat if anyone was looking. Um, really quickly, before while we're waiting for some more questions to come in, there, there is one question. Um, do you mind if I just add a little bit of like what our participation was? Sure. Um, so I was, I have some questions for Elizabeth too, but I, you know, that Linda Loring, we had two of the pollinator transects and joined in on the project. And I just wanted to thank Elizabeth for all her work in the project um, because it was a really great opportunity for us to be involved in a larger scale research project. Uh, we had the land and we had the ability to collect the data and um, and then we also benefited by getting some of the funds to do some management. And as I was really happy to see that you included those slides, I forgot that I gave those to you a while ago. Yeah. Um, but uh, I was interested to see, you know, with our pine removal that reduced the canopy and then opened the um, created more open habit or um, um, bare ground habitat with a lot of significant sandy cover. Um, I'd be interested to see, you know, as you said, five years is a short time for that vegetation recovery and also species recovery. I'd be really inter interested to see, you know, a few years out what that difference would be, because I do think that habitat change is really dramatic, right? Going from a, a Japanese black pine stand to now a grassland heathland stand um, with some more of that open space. So, um I think it's a it's been a huge uh, net positive to me, but I'm interested. Uh, it would be kind of cool to go back and see what's what's happening there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would love to go back to the Pratt and Nicholas Farm sites because they did their they joined the project a little late and did their habitat management really late. So it was just it was like a wreck out there. <laughs> yeah, when the project ended. It was just like wood everywhere and yeah but sometimes we always tell people that sometimes restoration is messy right it looks it looks terrible or there's like a big recovery phase before um you can kind of reach that target management goal mm -hmm. all right so um one of the questions um that you sort of answered in the um talk itself but just to revisit of uh, were there in, any endangered plant or invertebrate invertebrate species that showed up in any of the sites during the project? Um, we did not have any federally listed invertebrates. Um, the frosted elfin, which I mentioned, is in review. I don't even think it's a candidate yet, but it's they're looking hard at that one. It's it's um it we've lost a lot of populations of that one. Um, and it is found at several of these sites. Um, as far as plants go, I can't think of any federally listed plants. And I feel like I would have, I, I feel uncertain about saying confidently there weren't any, but I feel like I would know if there had been because we would have had to worry about compliance. Um, and that didn't, that didn't come up um, for any of the sites that I can think of. We did find a lot of new records. Um, for example, the 1B Protandrina and 
abdominal abdominalis. Um, it, it was found in the first survey in um, a site in Delaware, and that was the first state record. Well, actually, I think it might have been the first record on Delmarva. Um, and they, some other people went out when when that was found in Delaware. Some some other people went out in Maryland and found it also on Delmarva. So um, we definitely expanded the knowledge of distribution for a lot of bees and moths. I and I will say for Mass for Nantucket specifically, um, because we had two transects at Linda Loring, and then the Conservation Foundation had two transects at Head of the Plains area. For those who know that, it's on the south coast of Nantucket, um, we don't have any, uh, you know, entomologist experts on island. So participating in this project alone um, helped so much increase our knowledge of the biodiversity um, of the habitats or of the, you know, of the bee and insect species. Though, um, okay, so. One question was, could you share one insect species to say how the teams might have worked from start to finish? It's it's kind of a confusing question, but um, do you want to talk a little bit more about how the teams worked um, and how we yeah, got yeah. the species, the individuals to you? Yeah. Um, so for the bees, um, we knew we wanted to um, survey bees from the beginning. Um, but we were really struggling with how to manage this very geographically distributed project. So we, we thought the only way to do it would be to have individual uh, volunteers and staff at sites, um, you know, run the transects. And so we came up with a protocol that people who were not bee experts could implement. And then they um, bagged up their uh, the specimen, the bees, and sent them to UMass for the first year, and then the USGS Native Bee Lab for the the rest of the project. Um, and we contracted with um, Joan Millam and Claire Maffe to work through all of those bees. And um, the Bee Lab does have staff to clean, dry, pin the bees, and then Claire would just work through them and, and sort them. And then she would just work through and identify them. And honestly, like we generated so many bees that they really couldn't keep up. So we, one of our issues with the project was that the data sets were coming in pretty late. It was hard to get the analysis in real time because the workload of analyzing or identifying those bees was massive. Um, so when, when we understood that um, challenge for bees, we decided to do the moths a little bit differently. We um, hired on contract five moth experts each year and we had them go to the sites. So we had a little bit more consistency in the number of samples per year and the locations and the naming and the, the data quality was just better doing it that way. And then they would work through their identifications back in the lab. They just froze the moths until they could get through it. And they were able to keep up a little bit better. Um, it was still a lot of work to identify 1500 species. Um, and let's see, is that, does that explain the sort of the challenge there? I think that's a good indicator. I know, you know, one of the things we had the bee transects. And then if you remember, Elizabeth, we also did some target netting on yes. the host plants. And that I found as the non-entomologist and we were doing this work, that was the more difficult, um, uh, just, you know, for interest in data collection methods. Yeah, and because of that, we really didn't get very good netting data from most sites. Mm -hmm. um, the, the more serious site managers or people with some experience with invertebrates um, did better with that than, than some of the sites. And it meant it was very hard to compare that data across sites, um, but it would have been really interesting if we could have gotten it. Um, I'm interested, there are a few more questions, but just kind of following up on what you said, um, I was thinking about some of those difficulties, you know, it's great to work in those really broad geographic ranges 
for what it what comparing those common things of the zero habitats. Um, but in looking back on the project, um, would you have done things differently or how would you have done things differently setting up something like this from the beginning? Yeah. Um, though I think that we had really good reasons for focusing on this habitat type. I mean, I think that the Northeast, um, you know, it, it is a super important and and unique and limited habitat type in the Northeast. Um, but I think we made a mistake in trying to include sites from so many states or from such a large geographic area. Um, the project, you know, the, it, the nature of it is that the sites were autonomous. The sites could do what they wanted to do for their site. And we could provide some funding to support that but we didn't, we couldn't really direct it. Um, so we ended up with sites that were willing to volunteer to be part of the project. And it didn't, we weren't as able to be selective about which sites um, we would be able to work with. We also had, um, I mean, this is just the nature of this habitat type. A lot of the sites are pretty small. So having um, replication at the sites, having like a, a control unit and a couple of experimental units wasn't always possible um, on these small sites. So that was also a challenge. And if we had been more selective about our sites, <clears throat> we might have ended up choosing the larger sites where we could have had experimental controls. Um, and we might have gotten uh, slightly more confident um, results that way. Um, as far as um, you know, not having a staff. So pretty much just having me sort of coordinating the project from remotely um, and then relying on staff and volunteers at the sites. I mean, obviously that doesn't always work out and it didn't help that COVID hit right in the middle of our project. So there were a lot of sites that were not allowed to go out in the field, even though in retrospect, we're like, well, that was the safest place to be, but you know, that first summer, nobody knew, and and there were state rules and things. So, um, let's see. So, yeah, I think I think that you can either have a project where you get a lot of engagement and a lot of interest and a lot of participation, or you can have a science fix experiment. <laughs> but you can't really have both of those in one project. And um, and I, that's, so I think that's something we learned uh, from this large scale project. Um, and kind of following up on that, like how were the sites selected or encouraged to participate? I think that would be interesting to hear. Yeah, I mean, in the first year when the project was, when we first found out we had funding, there was a lot of um, just networking and reaching out to, um, a variety of sites to recruit them to participate in the project. Since we were all we were asking people to take something else on, there were certainly a lot of sites that just declined and said, like, "Yeah, we're a great site for that project, but we can't um, we can't take it on." Um, and um, nonetheless, like some of those sites, we were still able to ask them to fill out the survey and still able to learn about the constraints that they perceive for their site in terms of managing it. Um, and we had, we ended up with a pretty good mix. I haven't really counted it out, but I, I feel like it might be 50, 50 state owned and nonprofit, um, so yeah, some wild, like a lot of wildlife management areas in states, and then um, a lot of nonprofits. But even some of the state own sites, like the Albany, the um, New Jersey pine bush, for a lot of weird reasons, they didn't end up being able to follow through on the data collection and the participation as well as some of the smaller nonprofits did. So, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that being a hard group to wrangle, right? Like geographically spread out, really different um, 
ownership agencies, state boundaries, you know, differ. And then the effort among all the different partners. Yeah. Differ as well. You know, and then you have like, you know, staff turnover and I mean, so many things that affect the ability of a, of a group to follow through. Sometimes my point of contact was remote to the site. Sometimes they were on the site mm -hmm. um, and really different uh, personal exp expertise involved in each of yeah. my contacts at the sites. Well, I will say I am not an entomologist, but I'm a plant ecologist. So we were great at um, the plant transects, but um, I really... Yeah. I feel like I we benefited a lot from participating in this project. So, um, okay, another question that came up is since the project has um, more or less finished, is there a plan for doing the surveys again after you know X amount of years? Oh, uh, this is just the worst. I mean, <laughs> this is like the problem with um, ecological funding sources. They they end and then. Um, And this one did, it, it ended. And so each site would need to find their own funding to do it, to redo it. Um, we did, I mean, all of the vegetation data was pretty much collected by the sites and they, they have their data and they probably will continue to monitor. Uh, I, I would think most sites will be continuing to monitor their vegetation, especially in places where they did habitat management. As far as the bees and moths go, we returned the data sets for each site to them. So they have the data that we, they have the protocols that we used and they have the data that we generated for their sites. Um, so it is certainly possible for any site to resample at any interval that they want to. Um, the issue is the expertise to identify the species because it's, I mean, we we got every single moth expert in the Northeast on contract, pretty much. So there's only there might be three extras that we didn't that we didn't contract. Um, so the the expertise is really limited, and um, and for bees as well. Um, all of the people who can identify bees are completely booked. I think with projects and. Um, you know, so in terms of just uh, the, the entire ecological community, this ability to identify species is a is a real limitation for this kind of work. Yeah. Um, there is some possibility we may be able to go into a DNA, eDNA um, approach. People are looking at doing that for bees and where you sort of sample the flowers and then analyze them to see if you can um detect the bee species that way and that that would be that is probably the direction things will go because um uh, it's just not going to be possible to train that many people to identify bees and moths it's just yeah it takes a special kind of person for that job <laughs> once again i mean that's how we hugely benefited by participating in the project like the the time that we took to learn ourselves, be trained, train others, you know, over the five years, collect all the data, but then to get that biodiversity information back, like that's, that was so huge for us. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a Nantucket specific question. So since Nantucket yeah. is, very, someone says, since Nantucket <laughs> is a very special place, um, were there any species that only occurred on Nantucket or large numbers of certain species? Oh, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I feel silly for not having an answer to that question ready for this presentation. Um, but I think we did have, I think we did, we are able to um, list the species that were only found at those sites. And I, I will try to get the answer to that question and send it to you. And maybe you can okay. send it out with the recording. Yeah, I, I do remember the first year because the first year when Joan from UMass was doing mm -hmm. the um, identification that we were really proud because there was one bee that only occurred on our transect, specifically yeah. the north part of Nantucket. And I can't remember. I can't remember it it wasn't remember. a rare species, but it was like it only occurred. It was only found there. But that was just the first year of the project. And since right. that, then 
you know, obviously there'd been many more years of sampling, but also more sites that joined in the project. I'm going like this, like the geographic mm -hmm. range expanded. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, oh, we, one we of our all those species information. Yeah, and uh, to be honest, for moths, we had some issues in the first year on Nantucket because um, the the we were going to send Mark Mello out to the yeah. island, and he booked the he had to book the ferry, you know, way ahead, and then the weather was bad when he had the opportunity to come, and it just didn't. We did not have great data the first year, um, and what we ended up doing was much better. Um, so. So we basically, Mark just sent the buckets out instead of himself <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, it was great for us. I mean, I had worked with Mark years and years ago. I mean, Mark Mello, for those of you who don't know, like is the lepidopterist expert for the Cape and Islands. And um, I had worked with him many years ago um, at, when I was an intern. And so it was great to see him again and come out to Nantucket, but then he trained us all on just setting up the moth traps, you know, and, and then we were able to um, send over the moths on the ferry themselves. So we didn't have the moth expert on the ferry. We had, we put the moths on the ferry to get picked up on the other side, because you know, <laughs> yeah. you have to do what you have to do on Nantucket. So. Right. Yeah. So that was good. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I didn't have a question. I answered good answer for that question. That's <laughs> Um, well, if anyone has any additional questions, um, you can type them in. I think we answered all the ones on line, but I did want to, um, I had one other like thought slash question. I was really interested in your, um, uh, when you had the information about scrub oak, cause we know, you know, there with many of the barren obligate species love the scrub oak, the Quercus elicifolia. Um, and it's interesting because we have so much scrub oak here, but I don't, it's so low growing here. I don't consider it like um, a high canopy cover species. I would mm -hmm. think of it as in the shrub layer. Yeah. So it's so interesting thinking about like just, you know, the different um, recommendations for management. I mean, we we have so much scrub oak that in some areas we're managing it, um, not, you know, right. to encourage grassland species. Um, but then it is such a important plant for so many of the rare Lepidoptera that, I don't know, it was just a comment more than, than a question, really. Yeah, and I think it's also, uh, it also, is, it demonstrates the issue we have, right, where um, in some of our sites that participated, the scrub oak would be a little taller and it might be considered a canopy. And, and yet when we do these landscape analyses, um, we have to split things into canopy and shrub and mm -hmm. understory and grass. So, um, yeah, so that was. Well, I think it's, it's, it speaks to, to the value of both doing both the regional scale to get at these big picture questions of land management and target species and species of interest and how we manage for these barrens and, and zero habitats. But then it's also the importance of your Re, your local landscape and those microsite variations and you know really sp specific habitat types at any given site mm -hmm. cool all right well i think um unless anyone has any more questions i want to um thank you elizabeth so much for joining us tonight oh. and talking about this project um and I know that even though the uh, data collection is complete and the project is complete, you were kind of mentioning that there's still some products coming out of this. Yeah, I mean, we're still working on some publications of the data and, um, I, you know, because the bee and the moth data came in so late in the project, we we struggled to get the analysis done um, right, like right when the project closed. So we are, we're wrapping some of that up and, um, but that's that's the main outcome that we're still waiting to get done. Great. Well, um, for those of you who are still on or for just for the recording, I'm going to be sending the recording um, after this is done to everyone who registered. Um, we'll have it on our website. And then, of course, any follow up uh, publications that we have access to will definitely be posting on our website because we've been heard of the project and are excited to see it um, come to fruition. So thank you so much, yeah. Elizabeth. I really appreciate it. Sure, thanks. Great, thanks everybody.